So I grew up on a pretty steady diet of Sesame Street. Sesame Street, if you'll remember, was a collection of the world's most diverse population. I mean, there were big birds, things that lived in trash cans, yellow people, orange people, and real people. And somehow they all kind of got along. I mean, sure they had their challenges, but they always worked it out, and they always, <laughs> always said good morning to each other. When I was 18 years old, I moved from the suburbs of Richmond, Virginia to big old New York City. And I wondered why nobody said hello to each other. I mean, this was real life Sesame Street, right? <laughs> it wasn't that I grew up saying hello to everyone that I passed on the street, I didn't. But I thought, if surrounded by the world's most diverse population, how are we all gonna learn to get along if we can't at least say hello to each other? And then somebody said hello to me. Well, hello, baby, were his exact words. And I thought, I don't know, maybe uh, Sesame Street has grown up a little bit in the past 15 years. <laughs> so I said, hello, back. And he said, I want to fuck the shit out of you. Whew. Well, um, a fluke, right? That must be a fluke, you know, crazy New Yorkers. Um, and uh, as it turned out, it wasn't. I was harassed two, three, sometimes four times a day for about 10 years straight. I'm still harassed today. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a really intense experience for me. And it was an incredibly scary experience for me. And I felt alone. I felt like I was the only one. And I felt like if I truly let myself feel the pain that it felt to be street harassed day in and day out, that it meant that I wasn't strong. And so for five years, I walked on in silence. And then in 2005, I was on a roof deck with some friends, and we started talking about this thing called street harassment. And as the women in the group told story after story, I realized that I wasn't the only one, and I wasn't the only one who felt silenced by this either. When we walked down the street, and we wouldn't respond to the guys, we felt weak. When we, when we would yell at them, we worried that the situation would escalate, the police didn't care. And so we kept our silence. And as the men in the group heard these stories, they were so angered at the extent to which this was happening right under their noses. And as Sam Carter said, who's today our board chair, you live in a different New York City than we do. And we resolved to change that. And we did it the same way that change has always happened, people coming forward and telling their stories. But this was 2005. And two new technologies had hit the mainstream at that point, the blog and the cell phone camera. And so, we launched Hollaback New York City. And within weeks, New Yorkers were swapping their stories and sharing their photos. And then something telling happened. We started to get posts from outside of New York. We started to get posts from outside of the United States, even. And that's when we knew we'd hit a nerve. Today, we're in 15 cities around the world, including Mumbai, Buenos Aires, and Toronto. So what is this phenomenon that people are so eager to share their stories about? Simply put, street harassment is sexual harassment in public space. And it's probably existed since the advent of streets. But today, it's at epidemic proportions. Recent work by Holly Curl shows that 99% of women have been harassed at some point during their lives. And on the Hollaback blog, we've heard stories of women who have left their jobs, changed their commutes, because of a fear of being harassed. We've heard stories from girls as young as five for women as old as 70. We've heard so many stories, and for women with a history of sexual assault, of which 20 to 25% have, street harassment can feel like ripping a scab off. But it gets worse. You see, street harassment isn't just annoying, it's scary. And in the first four months of this year, 14 girls committed suicide in India as a direct result of harassment. And we never know when one comment will escalate, and too often, it does. In Washington, D.C., a woman was shot in the foot after refusing to respond to her harasser. In New York City, a pregnant woman was run over by a car and killed as a result of harassment. Street harassment is the most pervasive and persistent form of gender-based violence. And like all forms of gender-based violence, the people who experience it, they tend to blame themselves and they tend to be silent, just like I did. Now the skeptics will tell you that street harassment is just another form of courtship behavior. <laughs> 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 but
But if it is courtship behavior, it's what Marty Langland calls a spectacularly unsuccessful strategy. And P.S., it's the same strategy they use to defend workplace harassment, too. Harassment wasn't helping men get dates in the workplace, and it's not helping them get dates on the streets either. But if it's not just a bunch of nice guys trying to get dates, who is doing all this harassment? Well, we've been tracking it for five years, and so far the only consistent indicator we've seen for is population density. More people walking down the street, more people getting harassed. And just like there's no single profile for a rapist, there's no single profile for a street harasser either. Street harassment crosses lines of race and class, and that's because it runs deeper than the color of our skin or the income brackets of our neighborhoods. Street harassment is part of a broader culture, an international culture where gender-based violence is simply seen as okay. You know, street harassment is incredibly scary, and we know that it matters. But what we don't know and what is so hard to imagine is what the world would look like without it. Around the world, more people are living in cities today than live outside of cities. Over 50% of the world's population lives in cities, and more are moving in every day. And I live in Brooklyn, and every morning on my walk to work, two men say good morning to me. And when I first moved in, I was well-trained in my streetwise ways, and I learned to ignore them. I learned to walk on, because I was so scared that it would escalate, just like it had when I was 18 years old. But they persisted. Good morning, good morning, good morning. And so finally, after a couple weeks, I gave in, and I timidly said, good morning. And he smiled. And then the most incredible thing happened. Nothing. So then, the next day I tried again, a little more confidently. He said good morning, and I responded, good morning. Still I was safe. I tried it with the other guy. I was still safe. And now I say good morning to them every morning. And these guys are the nicest guys. They make me feel so safe in my own neighborhood. But this story is the saddest story, because I was trained to ignore them. I was trained to walk on. I was trained that the situation was escalated. I was trained by over 10 years of being street harassed day in and day out. And I'm not the only one. On our blog, there are hundreds of women of which good morning is just too much in the context of these violent streets. And I want to build a world where good morning never means anything other than good morning. And we can say it to people who do not look or think anything like us. I think good morning has the power to change the world and the way people live in it. I think in this morning, we're in this in this world where good morning never means anything other than good morning, the nice guys will come out of the woodwork. They'll be able to say things like, you look nice today, and it'll be heard as a compliment. And I think as women, we'll be able to wipe those tough girl looks off of our faces because we will know that no matter what we wear, no matter what we wear, no matter what we wear, that the days of she was asking for it will be over. And every day will be like a pride parade because we will be able to be authentically who we are. Because none of us are as simple as a list of physical attributes. We have the right to say who we are, not wait for somebody to tell us who we are. We have the right to define ourselves on our terms, whatever that means, that day, that hour, that minute. But we can't have this world can't have this world until we end street harassment. We need to acknowledge that it's simply not okay. And I think that we can do it. I think that as the internet, as our new campfire, we can change the culture by changing the narrative. We can transform street harassment from something that was isolating into something that's shareable. We can come forward and we can tell our stories. We have to show people what is wrong so they can see what is possible. Street harassment exists because of a culture where gender-based violence is simply seen as okay. But guess what? Culture changes. In the past 60 years, we've gone from a culture where people of color drink from different water fountains to a culture where we have our first black president. And the winds of street harassment are starting to change, too. In the mayoral election this year in London, street harassment was a campaign issue for the first time in history. 
New York City Council held its first ever hearing on street harassment this year. Egypt released a pamphlet. In Ireland, they released a public service announcement. These things have happened because bold people around the world have come forward and they have said no more. These things have happened because bold people have told their stories. So when I haul back, I do it for me, but I also do it for my city, my street, and the world. Join me. Let's work together to build a world that we can all be proud to share. I know that Big Bird would approve. Thank you.